Good morning, Southside. A special greeting to any visitors we have with us. We are always grateful to have you come and worship our God together. So a special greeting and welcome. Um, I just wanted to rejoice um, Galen's husband. She has just loved this body and served it so well. Um, he was a, an unbeliever and rejecting the gospel. And in the last week of his life, um, the gospel was proclaimed and there was a powerful conversion and transformation. And so we are rejoicing that her husband now is dwelling in the presence of Jesus Christ. And she woke up today to worship and hand out bulletins and come serve the body of Christ. <clears throat> much, much love to you, Galen. You are such a blessing to this body. Well, what a sweet season we're having in Philippians. If you'll turn to chapter 2 as we'll continue in our study uh, this morning. Paul's been teaching that we're to have koinonia, we're to have fellowship together in the gospel of Jesus Christ and understanding it, loving it, imparting it in each other's lives and taking it to the nations. And so we are locked in shields to, to lift high the cross of Jesus Christ. And the most important attitude now that Paul has been dealing with is this mindset then that we have in the body of Christ, that we are to, to keep unity, and that unity is going to come in this deep humility that Jesus had, the mind of Christ. And so we saw that humility is not so much looking at yourself saying you're bad, but it's getting lost in Jesus Christ and looking at him and all of his glory till we are taken up and we lose ourselves and not looking out for our own interests, but the interests of others. So when we by faith get this gospel, we're crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And now it's my life for yours. I get this gospel and I die and my life now for yours in the building up of this gospel. And I pray that this fruit is hanging on your branches as we are journeying through Philippians. This morning, we're going to continue in our study. And I think we're going to come to two of the most important verses in all the Bible before you say every pastor says that. Looking at sanctification and how the human effort and divine sovereignty work together to produce human obedience. I don't think there's a clearer verse in all of Scripture. And so we see that there is my working and his working, and what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. We are walking the razor's edge of our growth in Christ, the path that we must walk and balance in our journey to glory. The path that I've fallen off on either side many times and in many ways. The overemphasis on one side or the other. And my desire is to save you a boatload of mistakes that your pastor has made. So that you will bear fruit that will remain and will be abundant for the glory of our God. And so let me read our passage that we will look at this morning. We left off in Philippians 2.12. So then, my beloved... Just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let's go to our God together. Oh, Abba, Father, I thank you for the verses that are before us this morning. And I pray that your spirit would illuminate them to our minds and to our hearts and to our will. God, I pray that everyone in this room would lay hold of this blessed balance. God, that, the, that we would not fall off on the side of laziness. We would not fall off on the side of um, working to merit your favor and your acceptance, God, that we would journey this beautiful balance that your word reveals to us. And so, God, do more than we could hope or think in each life here this morning for the glory of God, I do pray. Amen. So let's take up this text this morning that Paul wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So I just want to remind you what we're going to look at this morning is the mind of God revealed to us in absolute truth without error and without mistake. And that's why we give so much attention to every word is these, these are the words of God. And so I guess where I want to begin is just with some observation about these verses that are before us. I've preached several sermons on this passage in my lifetime and did a brilliant job of lifting it out of its context 
and examining every Greek word and missing the full meaning of what they mean. So this morning, we're going to lock them in to the context. And so I don't want you to miss the, the prongs that this diamond of verses 12 and 13 are going to go into. So if you'll just look with me in verse 12, uh, in the New American Standard, it begins with, so then. <clears throat> I like the ESV. I think they captured the word better. Therefore, you know how much I love that word. And so we always ask ourselves, what is it therefore? I'm kind of disappointed that the NES would destroy therefore and say, so then. But it, it carries the same idea. Um, so therefore, we're to obey. We're to work out our salvation. And so this is really important that we get the therefore. The, the command, this is an exhortation. Work out your salvation. It's going to come from something. It's not just a blind command dropped into your lives this morning that says, do. But my love of Christian commands and duties is that God makes it a delight and a desire. He cares about your thinking and your hearts, and he raises them up, and then he says, work out your, sal your salvation. There's something true that is going to drive our hearts in this imperative. And so what we do then is we look back to the nearest context. And last week we saw that for this reason also, God highly exalted Jesus, and he bestowed on him the name which is above every name, kurios, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, since God has highly exalted Jesus Christ and gave him that name, the Lord of Lords, he exalted the God-man to the highest place for his work. Therefore, I want you to hear this this morning, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But if you'll remember back to last week, verse 9 started with a therefore. So we got to keep going. Why did God highly exalt Jesus? Well, verse 5, we're to have this attitude in yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus. And what was that attitude? Who, although he existed in the form of God before the creation of the world... He didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And these words I pray that we'll always worship at, he emptied himself. And he emptied himself by addition, by taking on the form of a bondservant. And Jesus Christ was made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. And for this reason also, God highly exalted him. And so the, the reason he exalted him is because he gave up his prerogatives and his rights, and he came to this earth to the point of death on a cross for our redemption. He didn't look to his own rights, his own needs. He looked to us, and he left glory, and he, he kenosis, he humbled himself. Therefore, in light of what Christ has done, the mindset for us is humility, and Jesus did obedience to death, even to the cross, a salvation that was accomplished. He did the Father's will, and it was done in perfection by the Son of God that we looked at last time. The one who was humbled was thus exalted by the Father to the absolute highest place. So you, child of God, are to have this mindset. You're to look out for the interest of others and not just your own. You lay out your lives in service to God and to other people who will face in this journey all kinds of humiliations and rejections and slanders and ungratefulness and stabbings in the back and cross-bearing. And you go in this season called humiliation and God knows how to exalt and he will exalt you to reign with Christ for all of eternity. So therefore, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because of Christ. Don't grow weary in well-doing when you look at what Jesus Christ has done for you and where he dwells now. And that's not all. Because last week, we walk away and we say, this is so hard. I'm wired to think about me. I struggle. I battle with remaining sin that likes to think about Ken Murphy. I, I like to think about Ken Murphy, not you. <laughs> I just like me. And I feel like the sun and that everything should revolve around me. And I looked at Philippians 2, 1 through 11, and my heart's just taken up with Christ. And on Monday, I went back 
to thinking about Ken. I remember some of you sitting here battling, right, with self. Maybe your kid threw up on Sunday night and you faked to sleep like I used to do so your wife would clean it up. And I walked out of church and thought, you know, no one really reaches out to me. I'm always reaching out to them. And someone stubbed me, and it, it made me feel like I don't matter, and I felt enmity. And that's our battle. That's why Paul's writing this passage. And so I love Philippians 2, 1 through 11. Jesus Christ is my example, but I need a vine. I need an example, but I need power to draw from. I need life. I need sap. And I need ability to forget myself and wash your feet. I, I need power from outside of me to come in if I'm ever going to do this. I just can't get over myself. And so the question this morning, is there any hope to become the kind of people that are being described in Philippians? And I say with a glad, resounding yes. Verse 13, we come now. We have a therefore, and in verse 13, we have a for. And the four now is work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It means because. And so as you do this, work out your salvation, you are going to have present enabling as you enter in. And so there is a power that indwells you called the Holy Spirit of God. And he's placed within every believer. And he's going to bring about Philippians 2, 1 through 4. He can get you to that place of humility and looking to other people's interest over your own. He's going he's gonna to be able to cause you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so I want you to have hope this morning. I want you to be filled with blessed hope that there's a greater power than your remaining sin that wants to make much of your glory and your selfishness. You have something more powerful than your selfishness. That's the hope of every child of God this morning. There's the power of God dwelling within me who Paul says he can cause you to will and to do his good pleasure, which was the mindset of Christ, who was the true spirit-filled man. And so let's drop this diamond then now as we begin with a therefore, you humble yourself and God knows how to highly exalt you on the last day and what you have at the end of this journey is so unbelievable. And I said it before, every day will be better than the last. Sit here this morning and go, therefore, Therefore, what, what's coming? And then go to four, you have great power. So you have a great promise and you have great power to do what we're being called to here in Philippians. So let's go. Wait, one last observation. One last observation. Look in verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, and I don't know what's happened in the church, but obedience has become like a word we don't like. And that is what Paul is after. You know what work out your salvation means? Obedience. Christian obedience. I think we don't like obedience because we don't understand Christian obedience. Um, I love Christian obedience. And so as we begin, I just one more time want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, I'm a broken record, but I, I want to be stuck on this till I get to glory. Uh, flip over to Philippians chapter 3. Paul says in verse 8, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. And listen to this. I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And so Paul doesn't want to have a righteousness or an obedience by his own working to try to keep the law to get his favor with God. I don't want a righteousness that is me grinding it out, trying to keep these rules and laws so that God might accept me. I don't want that kind of righteousness. That is not where I want to be when I stand before Christ. I don't want to come before the Holy One of God with blazing light and glory and say, here's my righteousness. And when I see him, I'm holding a filthy rag. I'm holding manure is the Greek word in Philippians 3.8. I'm just, it's manure. I don't want that kind of righteousness that burns up in the presence of Almighty God. I want the righteousness that, I love it, it's a God kind of righteousness that comes by faith in Christ alone and is put to my account. 
So I want you to get this. Any kind of obedience that we offer up to God must come out of rest in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For Paul said in Romans, in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And so I, I, be, I want to come with, I have this righteousness already put to my account and I, I'm accepted by God and he smiles and he rejoices over me this morning as I've put my faith in Christ. And then Paul moves in chapter three, go to verse 12. This is the part we're trying to balance this morning. Not that I have already obtained it, perfection, or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I might lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus, saved. Brethren, I don't regard myself as having, having laid hold of it yet. <clears throat> I'm not perfect. But one thing in the Greek, one thing, I forget what lies behind and I reach forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I, I am not perfect, but I am pressing on to become like Jesus Christ. I'm narrowing in, I'm laboring, I'm pressing for conformity to Jesus Christ. And so as we begin, I want to set this one more time. Obedience, this is how the Christians pursue after righteousness. It begins with, I'm justified. I stand this morning in grace. The God of the universe has declared me righteous because of Jesus' righteousness. I start knowing that I have that as I begin the Christian life. So I want to press on toward righteousness. And the gospel of the therefore and the if is to give you glad surrender, to give you glad obedience, joyful. And to remember this, I don't run to get accepted. I run because I am accepted. And so that's gospel obedience. There's a big difference. One is going to grind you and wear you out and destroy you. And the other is just going to be like the rising of the noonday sun. It's going to get brighter and brighter and brighter. So those are the prongs that this diamond must be placed in this morning. Do you have this? This is faith of the exaltation of the one who humbles himself at the end of this race. Faith that Jesus Christ died for your sins and gave a perfect righteousness to the Father. And by faith, that is put to your account this morning. It, it is yours. It's faith in the four that God is at work in you to make you like Jesus Christ. And the only sin that you can ever overcome is forgiven sin. So I begin this journey of obedience knowing that every sin has already been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's gospel obedience. And that's where we begin then this morning if you'll come journey with me. Here's your outline of the diamond Paul gives us five aspects to help us then in working out our salvation. Feels a little warmer. I guess when it's 100 degrees all week, that's what happens. <laughs> Hang with me. Um, we're going to look at the employment. Work it out. The eagerness is with fear and trembling. The encouragement is God is at work in you. The enablement is to both to will and to do his good pleasure. Or the exaltation is his good pleasure. So let, let's look at these things. So come with me then to verse 12. So then, therefore, my beloved. And I just want to be a pastor and, and a dad who sows exhortations in this soil, this atmosphere, and this aroma. I pray that you get this if, if you're a dad or if you're just in the body of Christ. Here's how you sow exhortations. My beloved. It starts with a heart that loves and cares about the person you're bringing the exhortation to, and I want to sow it with therefores and fours and all of these connections to get their heart and to, and to sow gospel obedience into it. So, Southside, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed. And so Paul says, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. And so this church, when we began Philippians 1, loved Paul, and Paul loved them. There was such a sweet relationship. But it was not Paul 
that they were trying to please. And so in Paul's absence, he's saying it's the Lord is your aim to please. You have the right motive in your gospel obedience. Much more that I'm now gone, you're still pleasing God. So work out your salvation without me, but do it for the Lord. So right here, don't, don't do it for your spouse. Don't do it for your elders. Do this for Jesus Christ. So what a beautiful exhortation, whether, whether, whether Paul's here or not. So just a quick application. I don't want a rabbit trail, but if you've lost a mentor, a pastor, a spouse, a, a parent as you've gone off to college, whatever it is, you're okay. You're okay. God is at work in you. And the means and the instruments are going to come and they're going to go, but God will never leave you and never forsake you. I just want to bolster you this morning. All you need is God. And he's going to bring instruments in and out of your life. God will never forsake you. That's for free. Let's go to our outline. The employment. So here's our employment. Work out your salvation. And, and it does, I just want you to hear it. It doesn't say work for your salvation. It says work out your salvation. <laughs> so what does Paul mean by this? Well, if you won't go back to Philippians 1.6, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He's going to finish the work. And so one last reminder, three aspects of salvation in the Bible. We looked at the, in Philippians 1, 6, there's the initial, and we call that justification. And that's when you come to faith in Christ. And Paul says, it's by grace that you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. So no one can boast. So there's the initial salvation. And then there's a progressive salvation. And that's where Paul says we're being saved in 1 Corinthians 1.18. So God is still saving us. He's growing us and making us like Christ. And it's going to end in the ultimate salvation where we are going to be like the noonday sun shining in righteousness with Christ forever. So three aspects of salvation that Paul uses. And so I want you to, to maybe just flip to Philippians 3.10 through 12. We just looked at a little bit of it. Paul's praying and he says, I, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death for a purpose. In order that I might attain to the resurrection from the dead, that's glorification. That's ultimate salvation. Not that I've already obtained that perfection or have already become perfect, but I press on. That's progressive sanctification. I'm pressing on in order that I might lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus, justification. He laid hold of me, he bought me, and he made me his own. And so here, all three of them are working together. And so what Paul's working, this is tricky, is that one of your salvation is complete. You, st you couldn't be any more justified than you are this morning before God. You couldn't be more acceptable because you are clothed in the perfection of Christ and your sins have been washed. You can't get more justified than you are this morning by faith. And Christ alone love that. But one isn't complete. And that's that we're pressing on to be conformed to the image of Christ. This, this word work out is a present tense imperative. So it's a command. And the word work carries the idea of what Sean read this morning, to work to the point of fatigue. So th this isn't just coast like little marshmallows on your way to glory. This is a call, it's an imperative, and it's to labor, to weariness. The tense is continuous, it's um, uh, strenuous effort, sustained. And so this idea of the quietistic, all I do is let go and let God and do nothing is not uh, the flavor of Scripture. We're not passive or dormant in our sanctification. You did nothing in your justification except hold out an empty hand. And sanctification there's, there's a call to be very active. And it's a pursuit, following after, pressing on, a contest, a battle, a fight, a race, a farmer toiling. Scripture is so filled with this idea that it is labor. And it's a call to work out what God has already worked in in the gospel. And so I'm to mine out of my life what God has richly implanted within me, which is everything pertaining to life and godliness. Work out in daily conduct what God has put in. And so what I want you to hear is this is to be committed to the process of my salvation being manifested in my conduct. I am committed to want to see Christ formed in me. As God is working in me, 
I'm to work out being a loving, humble man of God in this context and others in unity and joining together to advance the gospel. That's what I'm seeking. The law of Christ is that you'll love God with your heart, mind, and soul and strength and your neighbor as yourself. That's going to get worked out. By faith, I'm to work that out into my day-to-day living. And so I'm just committed to this. I'm giving myself laborious to this living in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm given to this because he's been given to me. Philippians 3.12, one more time, is is not that I've already obtained it or become perfect, but I press on in order that I might lay hold of that which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do I forget what lies behind and I reach forward to what lies ahead and I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing, I'm narrowing, I am going after the Lord Jesus Christ and we'll open that up in a, in a few months. One thing for now is I just don't see the let go and let God in that statement. And this morning, I'm asking God to make sure that we're on that razor's edge and we don't fall off on all the errors that can happen in the sanctification. So I just want to read a few verses to you. It's, I don't, Ken Murphy isn't, there's no authority to me. Romans 14, 19. So then let us pursue hard after the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. The famous one, 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you know that those who run in a race, they all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you might win. And everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I buffet my body and I make it my slave, lest possibly after I've preached to others, I myself might be disqualified. I I literally give myself a black eye in fighting my flesh. Paul wrote to Timothy in verse uh, 415 in the first epistle to him, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress might be evident to all. 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and you were made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Colossians 3.8, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Romans 6.12, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And so we can go on and on, but I just don't want you to miss, if you take out your human responsibility to work out your salvation with a hyper-Calvinism, you've missed it. I know we spent nine months on Romans 8, and we saw that God's grace will bring us to glory. And Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work will finish it. God is the one who's going to sanctify us. It is his work. I just want you to hear this so beautiful. He will bring you to glory and he will lose none of his children. He'll lose none of them. That's all true. And that establishes this sovereignty does not make you spiritual couch potatoes in your sanctification. But radical, wild-eyed Christians who work and labor to work out uh, the conduct of what God has worked into their hearts to love. Knowing apart from him I can do nothing while I seek to do everything through him who strengthens me. And I guess what I want to make sure you don't miss is the Christian life is not passive. Work out your salvation. Pursue hard after it. Work it out. That's to be the employment of the Christian. Secondly, we're to do it with an eagerness. He says we're to do it with fear and trembling. And how absent this is from the bride of Christ in America. We're to work it out with a fear and a trembling because the holy of holies now dwells within us. That brings a reverence and a trembling. And I want you to hear this. It's not a slavish fear that God is going to cast you off. If I don't work this out well enough, he's going to throw me away. That's not it. 
but it's the spirit is given to you that says that Abba, Daddy, adoption, and it drives out slavish fear. And it brings a reverence for God. The God who spoke the universe into being is in me working for his good pleasure. So it matters how I treat the unity of the spirit. It matters that I'm humble and I serve other people. It matters that the gospel is my chief interest and desire, and I want to see it spread. Work it out. It matters to God, and he dwells in you to bring that about. Matthew Henry said, the operation of God's grace in us, far from excusing us, but it's intended to quicken and engage our endeavors. It's to stir us to love and good deeds. Uh, Sean Killian was going to be happy. This is from Spurgeon, wherever he went. We are never to sit down and fold our arms and say, my life work is over. I'm saved. I have no pilgrimage to make to the celestial city. I wage no war for driving out the Canaanites. I, beloved, the time of rest will come on the other side of the Jordan. But as yet, it is for you to press forward like the racer whose prize is not yet won and to watch like a warrior whose conflict is not ended. Work it out until the fair likeness of the incarnate Son of God shall be manifested to all. Will you join me and pursue hard after conformity to Christ to work it out? Fear and trembling, let this be the preoccupation of your lives. I just pray that grace and sovereignty has not rocked you to sleep in this. It's to engage you. It's to cause fervency and desire for these things. The grace of God. So your employment is to work it out with fear and trembling. Uh, the eagerness, fear and trembling. And now the third point is I want the encouragement in verse 13. Verse 13, <clears throat> for it is God who is at work in you. And four is the key to the whole argument. There's no hope in work it out without that God is at work in you. Because I spent maybe 10 years trying to work it out in my own strength. And you know where I got? I didn't, even get, I didn't even stay neutral. I went backwards. Paul said, it, it's loss. Everything I tried to do was just leading me away from God. Just hear these words this morning. God is at work in you. Cults are all built of workout. And they're all built on a far off God that you're trying to journey to by your work. But Christianity joins us to our God by faith. A vine and a branch and it empowers us through a love relationship to just as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you in John 15. The greatest driving force known to man is love. And so he's a near God who is omnipotent, awesome, majestic, and sovereign, and he's working in us this morning. This is, a, this is called grace. The grace is the power of God dwelling within you for his power to conform you to the image of Christ. This is good news. And in the little Greek, it says this, God is the working one in you. God is the one who's working in you this morning. Uh, Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you might know what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. And then in two chapters later, Ephesians 3, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. It's God who's at work and you. Don't look at your sins and say they're sovereign. I can, it just can't be defeated in my life. Just take these words. It's God who is at work in us. God does this through his Holy Spirit who indwells us. And it's a shame that sometimes um, Reformed churches, we can run from much of an emphasis on the Holy Spirit. I always say the Trinity is the Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures. And this is the call that the Holy Spirit of God dwells within you. And he's the one working in us. And so anything spiritual or holy that we will ever do, he is the author of it. I can do nothing spiritual without the Holy Spirit working in me. And Jesus' whole perfect life was in dependence of the Holy Spirit who led him into those kind of actions. And so this verse 
is how working is not legalism. This isn't a call. Uh, This working is resting in Christ for salvation as the fountainhead of our strength. And it's not leaning on your own strength, but this is the one who's trusting wholly in the power of his God. And so it's working to the point of fatigue with absolute confidence because it's the power of God who's doing it through you. And here's where we're getting the sovereignty and responsibility. And Paul said, I labored more than all of them. And that's that word again, to the point of fatigue. I labored more than all the apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God in me. And it's God's grace who's causing me to do this. And yet I'm laboring to the point of fatigue. I'm narrowing in. I'm running for the prize. Paul's going and everything he ever accomplishes or does, it's because of God, his grace in me. So here's the balance that we're trying to find in the Christian life. So all sufficient grace dwells in you as you seek to be conformed to the image of Christ. Know that the power is yours by faith as God himself is working in you. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I got God inside of me. Is there any sin that his power can't conquer? And is there any sin that your power can conquer? And the answer is no. None, you can't conquer anything. And so let's go to our next point then, our enablement. So it is God is at work in you. How does this work? Well, as he works in you, uh, it's both to will and to do. And probably the key of the whole thing, I hope it brings the whole message together now if you're totally lost. How does his power work in us? Because I don't see much of it in my life and I don't see much of it in others. The power that we're carrying around inside of us is amazing. And the lives around me are not so amazing. And so is it like Popeye eating spinach and we just all of a sudden have power to go do everything? Is that how God's going to do this? No, there's something more powerful than that. It's what God is doing with your will and how he is changing your day-to-day living into love. Let your love be without hypocrisy. There's a debt you cannot pay, and it's to love your neighbor. And that is how this power is infused, and it works in us and for us. So a do loss, what we saw, a servant, that is what happened to Paul's will. It's to, to bring your will now. It's God's. And Paul's will before is, I'll kill anyone who names the name of Jesus, and now God has taken my will, and I will just give my life to exalt the name of Jesus Christ, no matter the cost. And so what power to take this man who was so unwilling and to make him so willing to lose his life for King Jesus. And so the gospel is not God suppressing my will and making me obey him. That's how earthly kings rule. But in him changing my will so that I desire most earnestly to obey him. I'll write my law within your hearts. I'm going to make it where you want to obey me. I'm going to put it right in there through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything we saw in Philippians 2 should put that within the heart of the believer. And so the key, what makes my will want him and likeness to him? Is the will this little neutral thing that just kind of chooses, you know, do I want chocolate ice cream or vanilla? You know, it's just a will that can go either way. It isn't. Everything you choose is by what you love. You choose what you desire. Your desires will drive your choices. If you love me, what? You'll keep my commandments. You'll be willing. If your affections love Jesus Christ, he says, you're going to keep my commandments. You want what you love and what you desire. That's how God hardwired us. That's the way we come into this world. We choose what we love. That's why unbelievers cannot choose Jesus Christ because they can't love him. Unless God gives you a new heart, you'll never choose him. And when he does, you'll joyfully, gladly choose him. So my affections, that's it. They're inflamed both to will and to do his good pleasure. And that's what God's doing in me. This is how he's getting this obedience to come about. And I want to tie it all together right now. How do I get my affections to increase and grow and be inflamed because these temptations come and I start wanting that more than I want Jesus. And so here's the link to work it out both to will and to do. It's called the means of grace. God has given ways to to instruct our mind to stir our affections 
so that we will choose Him. The Word of God. Fill my mind with this Word. As we were singing those songs, those scriptures that were coming up on the screen were so beautiful. And we study and we read and we meditate and we memorize this Word. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the truth come in. And this truth, what I've seen in Philippians 2, has just inflamed my heart. He didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grass. He emptied himself to the point of death. I just look at that. Here's my will. Here's my life. Stirs it to the point of obedience. So work at this with fear and trembling. So you don't go to the scriptures to just get smarter. You don't read commentaries so you can make great comments in Sunday school. You don't do it to remove guilt. I feel better when I read scripture. I think God likes me more. Don't do it that this is what I have to do if I'm a Christian. You missed it. You come to the word of God. God, grow my love for you. Let me see truth in this word and bring affection, bring desire for you and others. As I see my salvation from every angle, may it produce more love to thee, O Christ. As I understand sovereign grace, it's not to scalp Arminians, but to adore the glory of God that I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion and be amazed at the freeness of his salvation that saved a wretch like me. To see justification by faith in Christ alone is that I may know him. To let every doctrine and every truth take up your heart. This is kind of a simple truth, but disappearing today. The enemy wants you to think that hearing the word of God is the end. But this word is a means to Christ's likeness. And so this word, what this word will do as God is working in us, he will inflame our hearts in love to him. And we'll grow to one day say, I desire nothing on earth but him. That's what this word, working in the spirit, renewing our minds can produce. And then you will work out your salvation. I think of Jacob when he was serving Laban for his daughter, Rachel. In Genesis 29, 20, it says, Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. I've served the Lord 37 years, and it just seems like a day because of the beauties and the glories of Jesus Christ. So there are means, and I pray that your worship in public and private exalt your heart in loving him, your prayer the communion table is to produce an inferno of desire. The book I told us to read by Ted Tripp, Sunday Matters, to try to get my heart ready for the fullness of worship in the Lord's day and what can come. The whole context of this is fellowship. Fellowship in the gospel together. What this can do for our affections and our love and desire to serve Christ. So the beauty of God's power in us is he's causing us to will and to do. His power doesn't just overcome our wills and make you do things. The old covenant, I always said it, it was a, a sword that was given with the law that said disobey and die. And the new covenant is given with hands with holes in it and it makes us willing to go serve and love our king. We will work out our salvation. The fruit of lives given to this gospel, the beautiful likeness to the one who emptied himself for us, those genuinely from the heart, looking not merely to their own interests, but to the interests of others. The aroma of humility will fill our church and beautiful unity will result. And we can go forward intent on one purpose, one heart, one voice, one mind to glorify God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the kind of bride that any bridegroom would love. That is the glory of God. And that brings me to my last point, and I'll close out. The last E is the exaltation. And look with me in verse 13. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. His good pleasure, that which pleases the Father. As we're being conformed to his Son, I just want you to hear this. It brings pleasure to God the Father. I love when Jesus was baptized. This is my son in who I am well pleased. He, he says that to every child of God this morning in Christ. But I want you to see that as we're being conformed to Christ, the Father's pleased. He loves it. His good pleasure. It's amazing the God whom we're to fear and trembling, we can bring him pleasure. 
Christ's likeness glorifies the Father. Do you need anything more than that to lay your lives down? My conformity to Christ glorifies the Father. Doesn't that in and of itself make you want to work out your salvation? It pleases God. All those other prongs are great, but I love this one. It pleases my God. Let this be your blessed employment. God is working in you to will and to do his good pleasure. Work out your salvation. Be intense and intent through the power of God to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. If sovereignty has left you a couch potato, you haven't even begun to understand Scripture. And I close with a quote from one of my favorite books called Holiness by Grace. Brian Chappell says, as I'm writing, there are three oak trees outside my back window and they're waving their leaves in the cold midwinter winds. The waving is a sign of their obstinate nature. (laughs) All the other trees in our neighborhood have long lost and shed their leaves. But these oaks, however, they'll keep the brown shriveled vestiges of their formal life all winter. While the winter blast and freezes will strip the leaves from some stems and even make bald some sections of their limbs, the trees will not entirely shed the deadness that clings to them. And only when the warmth of spring activates the hidden energies in the oaks will the new leaves push out the old. You're starting to see the gospel. The expulsive power of our new affections operates similarly. And that's this beauty of Christ that we've seen in the gospel. And as the vestiges of our old nature, what we were in Adam, cling to us through the shriveled but still potent desires of a past way of life, No amount of natural effort will eradicate their presence. You can work at that forever and you'll never get rid of them. But through the rigor of our disciplines, the means of grace, they may remove, uh, sorry, not the means of grace, just our self-disciplines may remove some habits and change the appearance of large portions of, of our lives. We might clean up a little bit, but only the forces within us stimulated by the Spirit of God, will truly replace the vestiges of the old life with the vitality of the new. And so the power of the Spirit working within us will begin to drive out those old things that we were in Adam and will be conforming us into the image of Christ. And I'm praying for everyone who's discouraged and defeated that here this morning it is God who is at work in you. And he's causing you to will and to do his good pleasure. And so what I'm getting at is that spiritual change is more a consequence of what our hearts love than what our hands do. The spiritual disciplines are so important, but only in that they're developing a heart for God. So I go after every means of grace to get a heart for God. And only in that They're developing that, a heart for God. And then our hearts and our hands will be in accord. And we will work out our salvation for it's God who's at work in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. So we just journeyed a million different uh, doctrines and errors that we could fall into. If you understood nothing that I said, come see me. It might be a long line. Um, Get in your community groups. Please go work these out. Talk about them in your community groups. Go get brothers and sisters. We have to understand this. And so let's wrestle until we get what this is saying because it's so necessary. So I'm just going to close with three questions. Has the glorious gospel rocked you to sleep and left you drowsy? Where you're not pursuing and you're not working out your salvation or persevering in the means. You're just this little floaty just being thrown around by the winds and currents of this life. Is that where the gospel has brought you, the gospel of grace? Second, has the glorious gospel gotten lost where you are working so hard, serving everywhere you can, sharing your faith with every unbeliever that you can. You're working hard and serving everywhere so that you might earn the acceptance of God. You're you're laboring and you've lost that it seemed like a day serving for Rachel. You're, You're just 
working and you're frustrated and you're weary and you're bitter, you've lost the gospel. It's not God causing you to will and to do his good pleasure. And then thirdly, are you laboring hard this morning, working out your salvation out of rest? I am laboring like never before not to get accepted. I'm so free in that. I'm laboring because I am accepted. It is a beautiful thing. And it doesn't get tired for some reason. It's empowering. It's powerful. Be a humble servant, sacrificing for the children of God and the lost out of great joy because you've been loved by God the Father and Jesus Christ. Amen? To God be the glory. Father, we thank you for this marvelous word. And God, there are some confusing mystery in this balance. And yet enough revealed that I think we can understand this by your spirit. Thank you for this word. And I pray that what would be produced is a church that rests in this gospel, that stands in grace and the favor of Almighty God because of the work of Jesus. And that is so deep in our hearts that we press on, that we want to be conformed to Jesus Christ. We want to think like him, walk like him, and act like him. And we are pursuing it. We're not just hoping that we wake up holy. Holiness is a journey with very deliberate steps. So God, give us those steps by you working in us. Continue as we get in the means of grace and your Holy Spirit reveals Jesus through those means. And as we look at Jesus, we have desires and we have your power to do. Thank you for this gorgeous mystery. Thank you that you are at work within us so that we can work without us. God, thank you that we work and labor and we're completely dependent on your power and your doing. God, what a, what a blessed thing to set us free, to enter into ministry in areas that we're insecure, to love people in a whole different way, that we don't write people off and cancel them. We get in their lives and we labor with them. God, thank you for what this is calling us to. Let us grab hands with the God who's working within us to spread this gospel to take it everywhere and anywhere we can. God, take away fears. Perfect love drives out all fear and let it, let us be servants of the living God. God, do mighty things in Southside Bible Church this morning for your glory and your glory alone. Amen.